or uh, Yakwe Alep, as we would say in the Marshall Islands. Uh, I am both very excited and very overwhelmed to be um, presenting to you guys today. I didn't realize that within the first, within the third year of the third quarter of the first year of my PhD that I would already be presenting to such a big crowd. Um, when my uh, lab colleague, uh, Marta, asked me if she could nominate me, I told her, yeah, sure, I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna get it anyways, but look at where we are now. Um, and in the process of me being invited, it, it was kind of lost that I was actually a student here at the university. Um, so unexcitingly enough, I didn't traverse across the ocean to be here with you all, uh, as you can tell by my pale complexion, because I've been in Seattle this whole time. Um, it took me 10 minutes to get here from across the bridge. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Bevan series uh, for this opportunity to share the experience of the Marshallese people and for the series in general. Um, I feel like I've learned so much from the other participants. Um, and one in general that I um, really connected with was Mark Hatch's presentation on um, indigenous-led climate change adaptation and mitigation. As I saw some similarities between our two talks, um, I loved when he uh, he talks about um, he talks about a, a braid um, that is that represents, um, uh, it represents how, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, where am I at? Okay, so he shared the concept of the braid and how it represents a timeline that begins with indigenous uh, stewardship and connection to resource. Um, and then it goes into um, attempted erasure, and then this recognition of indigenous knowledge as actually a very valuable resource and tool. Uh, furthermore, Mark continued to acknowledge the different strands of that braid and how each, um, each different strand had its own uh, intrinsic value. And I don't know, something about that just really resonated with me. Um, so for today, today's presentation, I will be talking about community-based uh, fisheries management in the Marshall Islands. Um, which works through that same idea of intertwining uh, traditional ecological knowledge with Western science. Um, and through the empowerment of the local Marshallese people, it is a story of giving our people uh, the tools in the form of information and overlapping that with what they already know. Um, and this is important as it influences more agency and rebuilds stewardship um, over our own natural resources as we continue to do, do, uh, develop our resilience and to find ways to adapt to a changing climate. Um, and just quickly before I begin, I want to acknowledge some groups that have played some instru instrumental roles in my career, including uh, my past and current work. Um, from my team back home in uh, the Coastal Department of the Marshall Islands Marine Resources Authority, who in my early internship days, you know, would make me count, weigh, and measure thousands of confiscated dried sea cucumbers as torture. Um, to our regional collaborators at the Secretariat of the Pacific Community and the University of Guam, most notably um, Peter Hoke and Andrew McInnes. Um, a big thanks to my advisor, Luke, who is not here today because he's a traitor. Um, <laughs> And um, my mentor, Holly Barker, who both of them together encouraged me uh, to pursue a PhD. Um, so thanks for that push, because I was really hesitant. Um, a shout out to my lab, my lab colleagues and uh, at the Fish Collection, as well as my grad cohort. Um, you guys have been the biggest boost of confidence. Um, and to Dr. Sankita Mungbuhai, um, a fellow uh, Pacific Islander woman in marine science and Julian Aguan, environmental lawyer and author extraordinaire and somebody that I really look up to. And most importantly, my friends and my family who stand behind, beside, and actually completely surround me and every day tell me that I'm smart and to not say mean things to myself and I have presentations to do. <laughs> Uh, so the Republic of the Marshall Islands is in the Central Pacific and comprises of 
24 atolls and five isolated uh, low coral islands and is inhabited by about 50,000 people, two thirds of which live in Najro, the capital, and on Ibai, the islet of Kwajalein. Uh, the remaining population can be found scattered throughout the Marshall Islands in low densities uh, in, uh, around the neighboring islands. Um, so, not new news. Uh, currently, the Marshall Islands faces significant development pressures arising from extremely high population densities, dispersed geography, and environmental pressures due to low elevation, um, along with its fragile island ecosystems and limited resources that are exacerbated by climate change impacts. Um, the average elevation of the Marshall Islands is about two meters above sea level making 100% of the population at risk from sea level rise. Um, climate change is a reality of life back home. Um, so, you know, we're in some parts in the US, you get to have snow days. I got to miss school because of flooding and saltwater inundation um, as a result of, you know, a combination of king tides and storm surges and sea level rise. Uh, so although sea level rise is the most visible concern, the threats of climate change extend well beyond the inevitable, inevitable, <laughs> inevitability of flooding and loss of land. Coral reefs, which play an important role in coastal protection by acting as wave buffers and enhancing resilience of these small islands, are feeling the heat of sea surface temperature rise. Um, on top of other threats such as overfishing, pollution, um, and ENZO related fluctuations. So I took this collection of photos back in 2018 during a very intense um, coral bleaching event. Um, we had received distress calls from colleagues and friends who were concerned about the health of the reefs throughout um, Medoro and Guadalajan, um, which were experiencing intense bleaching as a result of a heat wave passing through the mid Pacific and Southern areas. Um, according to NOAA that year, uh, in incoming heat stress for affected areas in the RMI were at alert level two, which usually indicates significant, um, significant bleaching uh, that could lead to mortality. And a general observation we made during uh, our very quick surveys um, was that uh, there was a strong dominance of the priorities roots in all sites. And I'm, I'm not assuming everyone here is a coral expert, but if you know Parietes roos, um, it is uh, it is one of those corals that's you know it's super resilient, um, and in the Marshall Islands it has overcome um, issues in water quality such as you know those caused by pollution and other um, disturbances, including. Uh, climate change. Uh, it is so predominant around Majuro that it's earned itself the nickname uh, Majuro Coral. Uh, the issue, although with this dominant and resilient reef, uh, is that the Parietes roost does not provide the same type of habitat necessary for fisheries health. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, on the other hand, shallow corals with submissive forms relatively suffered more bleaching. Uh, these included um, Acroporas, Fossiliporas, uh, pavonas, et cetera, you know, a lot of the branching corals. Um, and this figure down at the left is uh, the NOAA Coral Reef Watch daily bleaching alert. And if you check it now, the area is much cooler as we're go currently going through uh, a La, La Nina phase. Um, but we also used a, a sea surface temperature uh, record collection from a wave buoy, uh, that indicated um, that around the time we were doing this bleaching survey, uh, the sea surface temperature was close to or over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it was very apparent if you were in the water, you'd see like a film like this thick of just like heat. And then, you know, this heat, hot water rises, right? Um, so, uh, these current anthropogenic pressures and the adverse effects of climate change, which affect the health of these reefs, are also ex expected to um, also impact reef-associated species. Um, through disruption of their individual performance, trophic linkages, recruitment dynamics, connectivity between populations, and other key ecosystem processes. 
Uh, climate change leads to the distribution of marine species resulting in uh, poleward shifts in trophic structure, which means for some species to stay within their thermal levels, they are having to move into deeper areas. And this is something that we've been hearing about in it's, it's, it seems to be a common theme in some of the presentations that we've seen during the Bevan series. Um, so this figure from Monday uh, dep depicts the influence of climate change on fish populations and communities through interactions between the physical environment, metabolic and behavioral responses of larvae and adults, um, and energy transfers between trophic levels and the effects of habitat structure on uh, ecological interactions. And this could, you know, possibly impact um, accessibility for marshfish fishermen, fisherwomen, fisherfolk, uh, who will have to find ways to access these deeper parts of the lagoon or outer reefs um, to catch fish. And, you know, not everyone has a boat, not everyone has the proper tools, and sometimes most people just prefer to spearfish and I, I mean, if they're very skilled and can go down 100 feet, like, good for them, but... Um, I don't see that being a very common thing. Um, so it's even more recognized now how food security and therefore the protection and resilience of coastal ecosystems are of paramount importance. Um, early settlers of the island were always um, acutely aware of their limited resources. And so conservation practices have always existed in the Marshall Islands in the form of a no or a taboo, uh, which is a system uh, that a system used by traditional leaders to designate parts of the land, whole islands, reef areas, or restricted sites to conservation practices. Um, fish being a main staple in the Marshall Islands, um, Marshallese people who were already, you know very skilled navigators, uh, adapted to become also expert fishermen as well and uh, developed over like 50 different fishing um, techniques pre-European contact. Um, but the arrival of colonists, colonialists uh, brought imported fishing gear to develop modernized fishing methods. You know, soon enough, hooks made of oysters, oyster shells and um, were traded in for metal hooks and synthetic nets replaced woven ones. Traditional canoes were replaced by boats and ships. Um, and in some atolls, you know, however, um, those early techniques are still practiced, uh, such as the use of the ne or the stone weir, uh, which is when um, a circle is built uh, on a shallow reef using rocks with a sort of opening and fishermen kind of go through the reef and shoo the fish into this fish trap and then in, in closing them into that trap and then using either a spear or a net to scoop them up. Um, another example is the alele and these are actually photos from like two weeks ago um, where they use a coconut frond weir um, and they encircle a school of fish. Sometimes it's just 20 people, sometimes it's 200 people. And they all just walk towards making noise, splashing in the water, um, shooing the fish either onto the shore or just in, again, encircling them and then scooping them up with the net or using a spear. Um, and these, what I really liked <clears throat> about, um, what I really like about these methods is that they, um, a big thing about them is community engagement and people working together. Um, you know, this and it builds communal ties and a sense of taking care of one another, um, something you don't see in current fishing practices. And these methods were also very selective as fishermen could take out smaller fish and release some, which made them very sustainable. Um, although, you know, I, can't imagine what kind of trauma uh, a fish that was yelled at and um, shouted at into a frenzy would deal with later on. Um, but anyway, as time progressed, the impacts of overfishing through commercialization and over exploitation and land based pollution 
and now combined with an array of adverse impacts of climate change have led the RMI to look at other measures to improve management, um, essentially for uh, climate change adaptation. So therefore, in 2006, the RMI along with the Republic of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands, um, all collectively committed to initially conserve at least 30% of their nearshore marine resources and 20% of their terrestrial resources across Micronesia by 2020, which they did. Uh, the Micronesia Challenge, as it is referred to, now tasks these four players to conserve 30% of their terrestrial resources and 50% of marine resources by 2030. And you're going to sit there and you're going to wonder why. How did the Marshall Islands in 14 years accomplish this goal? Well, let me tell you. Um, in 2006, after committing to the Micronesia Challenge, a consortium of both government and non-government agencies with a common interest in conservation, development, and management of valued coastal and marine resources in the Marshall Islands, which include the Marshall Islands Marine Resources Authority, the Marshall Islands Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the Marshall Islands Conservation Society, Climate Change Directorate, um, the National Disaster Management Office, just to name a few, um, who are referred to as the Coastal Management Advisory Council or CMAC, um, along with their regional and international partners, uh, collaborated to develop an overarching national conservation framework, which would be the Raymalak National Conservation Area Plan. This framework was completed in 2008 with the facilitators, facilitator's guide following suit in 2012. So the word Raymalak means to look ahead or to look towards the future. Um, the eight step process employs community-based tools and approaches to articulate local objectives that translate to national, regional, and international goals uh, for the conservation and management of local resources. Um, so in the Marshall Islands, the way that uh, the government works is uh, the government has, man um, has the authority to manage, uh, sustainably develop, and conserve its natural resources. Um, but decision-making about the use of those resources significantly occurs uh, within um, the local communities. Uh, so each atoll and individual island consists of a local government that presides over the resources within a five nautical mile um, of its shores. So uh, with important decisions always being made with careful consideration um, and permission from traditional leaders. So the way the Raymalak is initiated is, um, uh, typically a like member of local leadership, usually it's a mayor, um, requests it. It's very bottom up, it's very community based, it's very grassroots. Um, it's not a process that we imply on our communities, it's uh, requested when needed. Um, so after this request is made, the national team is put together and a schedule and budget are, you know, Put together uh, in preparation for visits to the target community or whoever requested their presence. Uh, so that's already steps one and two. Steps three, step three is the first engagement with the target community to build um, awareness of what Raymalak is and why this particular community would even have to go through this planning process. Um, step four is the gathering and analysis of various natural and social resource data parameters in order to design and ultimately legislate an integrated atoll resource management plan, inclusive of programs to um, ensure ongoing monitoring and adaptive management and retention of local commitment. <clears throat> uh, so because sometimes, you know, uh, atoll municipalities can be unique from one another, uh, this process is, can be um, implemented uh, either in a linear or iterative process. Um, and doing it this way uh, cultivates a sense of trust and shared purpose within the community. Um, and the, within the community and the Raymalak facilitators, uh, ensuring that the process is both 
an empowering experience and encourages natural national cohesion, um, which is which seems to be um, a running theme in this presentation. Because coming back to earlier fishing methods that required community cohesion and having a shared purpose among everyone involved. Um, in this case, it is in the relationships within CMAC as well as with CMAC and uh, the local communities that they work with. And uh, here are, this is just the current list of atolls that have went through the Reymala process and where they are now. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, sometimes the uniqueness of an atoll can affect how the process is being implemented. So um, Medro is an example of a special case because Madra is so uh, densely populated. Um, and the way that land ownership is managed is different than it is in low density areas. Um, so in this situation, it's easier to break it down into more malleable pieces for the Reymalak process to run smoothly. Um, and in Madro's situation, either district council leaders make the request or actual landowners do. And that's why if you look at this particular table, um, you see Madro in there multiple times, but with a specific site indicated. Uh, and then, so I wanna circle back to step four and kind of describe some of the survey methods that we use uh, to collect information from the local communities. Uh, one of them is the socioeconomic survey and it's used to assess and understand the degree of dependence that uh, local communities have on their natural resources. Uh, the survey extracts information surrounding household income, marine and terrestrial use, uh, use of materials pertaining to handicrafts, uh, the community's understanding of the status of their environments and human services. This could be um, access to health, access to education, um, access to electricity, uh, solid waste management, freshwater accessibility, um, the community's um, understanding of the severity of climate change impacts on their um, environment. And if there is a current existence of aquaculture operations. Um, and here are some fishery specific questions um, from the socioeconomic survey, which kind of end up having a really cool overlap with the data that we collect during our um, scuba diving surveys. Um, and some of these, you know, it's just asking for what kind of gear type is used in their fishing methods, where they like to go fish, how much they like to fish, um, how much they catch, if they're selling their catch or if they're keeping it, um, some known cyclotoxic species, um, spawning seasons and which species, uh, and maybe just what are their favorite fish and the fish that they like to target the most. Uh, so the Marine Dive Survey provides a better perception of human impact on coastal reefs uh, dive sites are stratified by um, major reef types and representative geography, um, as well as site proximity to human influence and current management regimes, whether a site is a traditional MPA or unique in another way. Um, we stratify by reef type since reef type communities can be different for um, fish. And here are just some examples of um, uh, some locations on, this is Namo Atoll. Uh, and then we have another one. Uh, this is Mille. And we really tried to um, kind of check all our bases and um, reach what we can only assume are very, um, kind of well-used reefs, um, but also reefs that are far enough from human population just to use that to compare to the reefs that are closer. So uh, these are the fish, these are the methods. Uh, so fish stock assessments are analyzed through a stationary point count technique where two observers move along a five by 50 meter transect, um, stopping at every, 20 meters for the first observer to um, conduct a, uh, to um, 
count and measure fish within a five meter radius for three minutes, while the second observer is um, recording food fish. Um, so they're both recording food fish, but the second ob observer is recording food fish that are um, bigger than 40 centimeters and that are outside of that radius of the first observer. Um, Macroinvertebrates are uh, counted by two divers on each side of the transect, kind of doing like a weaving in a zigzag um, way, um, one to two meters out from the transect and then back in and just recording what they're seeing in uh, the reef. Uh, photo quad jets uh, record benthic substrates by taking a series of photos along the transect. Um, and then photos are later analyzed using the National Coral Reef Institute's Coral Point Cover software, which applies random points to a photo um, for identification of different uh, substrate uh, cover percentages. And it kind of looks like that. So it just throws random points on the photo and uh, leaves you to identify what the kind of substrate that that point has landed on to then paint you a better picture later of um, the, the um, substrate percentage cover. Um, and then uh, coral quadrats, uh, coral assemblages are assessed by tossing 10 replicates of one meter by two quadrats along the same transect lines with each quadrat um, looking at species richness, um, colony sizes and relative abundance, which will say that. <laughs> Um, simple enough. And these are the types of surveys that we can, you know, um, that's, these are the type of survey results uh, that we get from our fish stock assessments. And um, what we can do with this data is show communities comparisons of um, fish biomass per species across surveyed atolls of the RMI. And this shows like a great comparison between atolls, especially when considering atoll size and population density and how those variables can greatly affect uh, differences in biomass. Um, the biomass per human area uh, surveyed further highlights how the amount of people uh, is changing the fishing pressure on a given reef. Um, and local analyses are done by, you know, looking at trophic structure and by certain fish groups. Um, our uh, invertebrate graphs are representative of community gravity. Um, so a big takeaway is that essentially uh, giant clam abund abundances are driven by um, proximity to communities, basically because people in the Marshall Islands eat a lot of giant clam um, for subsistence. So more clams can be found further away. And yes, this is all very basic common sense that if you put the resource further away from people, that there would be more of it. But what is important is that these trends exist throughout the country. Um, so we're collecting all these important indicators to access uh, fisheries on multiple scales. Um, we can assess invertebrate fisheries and fish resources, but also by collecting this data together, um, we can have the capacity to uh, develop fisheries-based management uh, tools in the RMI. Um, and we can look at like how are the abundance of sharks affecting like benthic communities. We can look at how are certain pair of fish communities um, densities or biomass um, affecting reef communities and also abundances of coral and algae. Um, and this is just a really cool highlight of how we can overlap data from socioeconomic surveys with our dive surveys and showcase how um, Local frequent fishing spots show up in our surveys and we can see characteristics of overfishing and how that paints such a vivid picture for the local people, um, for them to visually see their impact, especially when they can report like a decrease in biomass or of a certain uh, species. And we're like, yeah, look, it, we can see that, it shows. Um, and it's even cooler when you actually have the map of the dive sites available as well so that you can actually like be like, oh, Malo one is this site over here. And then a guy will be like, hey, that's my fishing spot. Um, and you're like, well, it's overfished. Maybe you should stop fishing there. I don't know.
after we've collected all of the data, we come back to the community um, to then develop the management plan because now we have all of this wonderful information for them to use in, um, in you know, I'll just go. Uh, so the first part of this is to create what we call a local resources committee. And this is a committee that um, will be working with the Remalak team for the uh, rest of the development process. And usually it, it comprises of different members of the local community, like different representatives. So we could have teachers, we could have doctors, we could have um, fishermen, we could um, have uh, just anyone who represents a certain demographic of the community, just to have that, um, just to assure that everyone's um, opinions are being um, added to the decision-making the decision -making process. Um, and then the first step of this is to build a community vision or what they envision their community to look like in the future, because this is where from that community vision, um, they can identify goals to reach uh, what that vision entails. And from the goals, uh, they can develop the objectives um, and then create an action plan strategy to, um, to reach those objectives. And yeah, it's a cool like uh, hierarchy, like um, boss again. Anyway, uh, and then the last part of this is for them to identify marine resource management methods. Um, and then so we give them a couple uh, recommendations or just some suggestions suggestions on way that they on ways that they can do this. Uh, one of them is to maybe implement a marine protected area. And um, we have categorized four uh, different types of protected areas. The first one being subsistence only. And this type of area is managed for subsistence and non-commercial use. Um, type two is high level of protection. Uh, this type of area is subject to no take. Type three is restricted and protected area. Uh, this type of area has total restrictions subject to no activities either within a large protected area or in a identified protected area. And type four is the traditional mill or the traditional um, area that's been um, kind of closed off by a, a, a chief. Um, so yeah, the type of area includes parts of land, a whole island or a reef that is managed and restricted by a chief. Um, and sometimes this is what it, ends up looking like and the colors are lost on this one but this area is supposed to be like all green so it indicates that it's a subsistence only area and then like down here is red um down here is red and red and up there is red um which indicates that these are um no take zones and i feel like they probably considered that because it shows right here that maybe this is a very important like ecological site because it's a bird island um, so they've decided to close that off. Um, so yeah, these are just some examples of how these maps come out. And something that we like to tell the communities is that the bigger your marine protected area is, the more um, eco ecological variance um, of functions there is, the more biodiverse. Um, yeah, so if you can get it up to more than 10 kilometers, um, you can have a more well-balanced reefs with um, different um, ecological players. Uh, some other regulation types include uh, size. Um, bigger fish have more eggs. Uh, also, uh, bigger fish have bigger appetites. Um, and Right here, we have a table that shows some of the more common food fishes of the Marshall Islands and what their minimum size uh, should be. And this is just, uh, this table was created as a result of um, regional monitoring um, throughout the Micronesian region. And it's just like, um, it's from 
understanding at what age or size um, these various fishes uh, are able to start reproducing. So they find that age um, that's very intermediate uh, and doesn't um, take away any um, important, uh, it doesn't affect like recruitment and uh, growth. Um, also, they can look at changing up their target species, um, especially through uh, banning ones that, banning certain types of fish that are um, very vulnerable to fishing pressures, whether it is because they, maybe they take uh, longer to reach a reproductive, reproductive age, or um, actually that's usually the case. Um, so some other methods to reduce fishing in inner reefs um, includes using anchored fish aggregating devices, uh, which are deployed to promote sustainable fishing and food security in neighboring islands. This influences uh, the local communities to utilize parts of, it's usually the outer reef that usually they wouldn't um, go fishing in, but now that they have this aggregating device, knowing that these aggregating devices bring um, fish together, uh, they can easily go to these spots and catch uh, pelagic species um, and take you know pressure off of the reef fishes in the lagoon. And also ends up being a big community exercise, um, which again promotes you know good cohesion and uh, shared um, shared goals. Another method is through promoting alternative livelihoods like aquaculture for marine ornamental exports. Um, Mimra employees are sent out to different atolls to train um, the locals to uh, kind of raise giant clams um, and sometimes even develop coral farms. Uh, and it's a good way to not only provide food security, but also an income opportunity as they can export these corals. Corals, export these clams. Um, another method for reducing fishing pressure is um, through increasing support to artisanal workers and farmers by developing markets for the sale of crafts, goods, and produce to urban areas. Um, yes, this is my personal collection. <laughs> Um, so, um, through the effort of, you know, the national team in collaboration with, um, so this is the LRC from NAMO. Uh, so through working with them, um, and their ability to interpret the data we've shared and integrate that into their own understandings and um, of their natural environment, they can make they can then make sound uh, decisions regarding uh, the, the sustainable use of their resources and end up with something like this. Um, so this is just the front page of the local resource management plan for Arno Atoll. Um, and you know we highlight that it was prepared by them with just some assistance from us. It was mostly their um, effort. Uh, and here is what could be an outcome for maybe a marine management plan for the Atoll of Arno, um, where they've decided to de designate different inner and outer reefs as sustainable zones, as well as no-take zones. Um, another example is from Namo where they took a different route and implemented species regulations instead. And I remember that this decision was made after uh, their data highlighted a sharp decline in um, large piscivores, more notably uh, large groupers. Um, so they kind of implemented, the, um, they kind of just agreed that these fish were important for their um, natural ecosystems and decided, okay, maybe we can give them a break um, through knowing uh, their spawning seasons, um, ended up, you know, uh, implementing these laws that say 
to not um, fish them when they're going through their spawning periods. Um, they also added a Lithrinus, uh, the orange spotted emperor fish as well, with the same indication that it should be left alone uh, during its spawning season. Um, and then so after the plans are finalized, they move uh, through the sign-off process, which is when we bring in the big guys. Uh, it's usually the mayor and um, the chief of whatever atoll the management plan belongs to. And they go through it one last time and they decide, okay, this is perfect. Let's implement this, sign it off. And then they sign it off. Um, and then the following last steps um, of the Raymala process focus on just implement implementation support and continued monitoring, monitoring of the atolls to assess progress in achieving plan objectives, as well as observe changes in the natural environment. So it's just some highlights and challenges. Um, this framework is great because it's an integrated resource management. Um, it uses cross-sectoral collaborations uh, via CMAC. Um, it is a national government framework, but it's very community driven um, and it's it uses conservation based on science and cultural needs. Um, there are, however, some logical constraints. Um, for one, cell service is not widespread in the islands, um, and if a neighboring island doesn't have cell service, it's not the best. Uh, it's not really easy to plan visits with the community. Um, and sometimes your schedules don't match. Sometimes transportation may not be available. And so there tends to be a lot of waiting around and waiting for callbacks. Um, another challenge is emerging issues such as climate change and disease epidemics and pandemics. Uh, during drought seasons, our um, small survey boats are and the local airlines are usually chartered by disaster programs to de deliver fresh water and other goods to communities in need. Um, this end up, ends up like halting our observations, which I mean, it is for a good cause. Um, but then there's moments where you're already on an island and they tell you that the plane can't come because it's doing you know rescue missions. And then you're stuck there for like two weeks. Um, so that happens. Uh, and then there was one year uh, we halted all visits to target communities because of a dengue fever outbreak. Um, and of course, COVID, you know, had some of its issues as well. Um, being able to continuously monitor and update management plans is a struggle because of a lack of funding and sometimes personnel. Uh, there are only so many neighboring islands you can visit in a year. Sometimes you have to prioritize adding new ones to the Imanlak list, to the Imanlak list versus returning to others. Um, unless there is a real cause uh, or concern brought up by community members, for example, sometimes maybe there is an extreme oil spill or something and they would like to remonitor an area, um, then we can prioritize them. Uh, for, but for the most part, um, there usually is no immediate need for monitoring. Uh, and we do want to provide the support to local communities so we can assess their progress in relation to their set goals. But perhaps we can also provide them the tools to do this themselves. Um, and I am not sure yet if this has already been implemented, but MIMRA was partnering up with this company called C2 Pacific to develop a community marine monitoring toolkit uh, that is supposed to be standardized, uh, that is supposed to be a standardized process for communities to conduct monitoring work and provide information from um, many sites. Um, another challenge is the local government's limited capacity for enforcement. Uh, usually these communities will have less than like five motorized boats and even then they couldn't possibly uh, chase down foreign po uh, poachers. Um, and the RMIC patrol wouldn't make it there in time. So <clears throat> we like to ask these communities to either try to take photos or take down the name of the, the foreign vessel in their reefs and if like, you know, if they can see them from shore um, and then just report it to the national government. Um, 
let's see. There is also a need for more technical and financial commitment from CMAC and other partners. And something that was the most exciting about CMAC and having this collaboration between these various agencies is that there would be, you know, shared costs for trips to target communities. However, you know, sometimes people's priorities change um, and budgets end up being used for projects that don't correlate with one another. Uh, so there is a need to practice maybe better cohesion and collaboration in order to cover more ground and do efficient and effective work. Um, and lastly, a shortcoming of the Ramallah framework um, that I highlighted in my master's thesis is the lack of women's participation during the process. Um, while visiting local communities and working with them to develop the management plan, I was often the only woman in the room. Um, after some investigation, I learned that the women are either busy tending to the children or cooking or cleaning. Um, and sometimes they would assume that their information they could share was not even important to the work. Um, and because of this, um, Mimura plans to work with the Secretariat of the Pacific Community or SBC to develop a more inclusive socioeconomic survey as well as to incorporate uh, gendered concepts into the overall Remala process. And it is, MIMRA and CMAX goal to integrate other marginalized groups into the discussions as well, especially if there are people who can't physically attend the meetings despite having stakes in the management of local resources. Um, so recently, the, the Protected Areas Network office has been uh, erected at the MIMRA headquarters um, and the Protected Areas Network is a funding support uh, for local uh, local communities and their uh, resource management. Um, it it utilizes the Micronesia Trust Fund um, to support these communities in their grassroots projects. Um, so that's uh, one of the challenges. I feel like I skipped something. Um, I did. Uh, I forgot to mention, um, and I'm sure it's probably a question in your minds that when these local communities uh, develop their regulations, you know, are they accepted into national law? Right. Are you wondering that, Laurel? Okay. <laughs> um, so through the implementation of the Remala framework, um, Mimra has helped and you know, help develop and implement these sustainable natural resource plans, local governments, and remote communities through the RMI. And these efforts have furthered the country's overall uh, determination to achieve local, regional, national, and international goals. Um, these plans provide communities with benefits that include opportunities for, um, for grassroots projects. Um, and they also provide the local government more authority over their natural resources through the development of ordinances um, so they can pass their um, develop regulations and through ordinances to the national government. And then it is taken into law and thus gives the community the power to uh, prosecute or fine um, any, anyone who breaks their um, local rules. Uh, so yeah, through the Remala process, communities are able to make, you know, sound decisions about marine management methods and just um, take better care of their resources and have the power to be better stewards and feel a little bit more um, prepared for upcoming um, impacts of, you know, current issues such as climate change. Um, and I think this is the end of my presentation. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? You can feel your own questions. Oh. Um, sure. I don't know if it's the same question, but has there been a strain in the area for water fish? Because I hear that also is another impact for like saltwater fish and coral reefs. 
Like, you know, like that grade, like, you know, where they take you to the pool of instance. That's a, that's a group of communities before. Are you talking about like aquarium fisheries? Yes. It's sometimes people go to those communities and just collect them for like, just for like, you know, pet trade, not just for eating. Mm -hmm. um, it's very well regulated. Um, you need like certain permits to take certain types of fish. Um, yeah, so it's not a huge um, issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, your position as chief scientist has allowed you to work with foreign scientists and making sure that commercially people are also involved in your project. And I was just curious how your experiences with that interaction was and how it was to be I've been able to join some really cool projects and be a part of some really cool research um, that I get to, you know, be noted down as an author for. Um, one in particular is with um, these particular scientists who are interested in studying um, how climate change affects um, corals in the long run. So they came in and um, I got to help them bore through corals and then like understand how they study the lines uh, that are shown like, you know. Um, so yeah, you get cool opportunities like that to like learn these new things um, and these new different types of research. And then, you know, you have folks who come in without letting um, the authority know that they're coming and then they do things and then they get in trouble with local uh, communities and their traditional leaders because they didn't go through the, the protocols of, you know, coming through us and us introducing them. And um, yeah, so some, just two examples. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was a great talk. Um, um, the, uh, you, you referred to two sort of, I'd like to sort of ask, get your thoughts on. One was poaching and one was pelagic species. So I'm assuming the Marshall Islands is part of the, I can't remember the, 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 the Puno process. And I, what I'm really interested in is how, if at all, communities are involved in building the national um, policy that, uh, you know, Marshall Islands will go to SPC as part of the, the, the agreement for tunas. How does the whole tuna thing interact with these processes? Because I'm assuming a large amount of the revenue from fisheries is coming from, from access agreements. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually pretty separate. Uh, so with MIMRA, it has two different departments. You have the oceanic and the coastal department. And um, typically the oceanic makes the most money because they're the ones with the permits for the tuna fisheries. Um, and usually it's, they use that funding because it's, you know, you're giving away um, resources that belong to the Marshallese people to then support these coastal, uh, coastal uh, local community developments. Um, but yeah, they're very separate. Yeah, so I oh. Yeah. I know this, but you mentioned a lot of like um, management methods and management of agriculture, and I'm just curious more if fishing methods influence like the impact of like actually in, or implementing these strategies. Oh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. <laughs> From like the methods and strategies for um, fishing management, as a culture, traditional like fish methods influence like the implementation of that. Um, are you asking if the integration of like more traditional fishing types um, influence? Um, so I didn't really show some examples of like what the objectives of these plans actually look like. And some of them do like um, include in their objectives to like um, bring back traditional fishing um, methods to encourage more sustainability. Um, some of them in, in, some of them want to bring back, you know, things like 
um, using traditional sailing canoes. Um, so there is an effort to like make that shift because they understand that it's a lot more um, sound for environmental management. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did that answer your question? Uh, so it says, I noted that there were hardly any women from these meetings and planning. Thank you for mentioning this omission. Hopefully your presence made the community see the value of having women in these meetings. That's nice. <laughs> yes, Marta. Oh, congratulations. Hi, or that comment. Um, so can you give us some examples of how you're trying to get women um, included in that process more? Yeah. Are, are there some things that are happening that you can tell us about? Yeah, something we try to do is with the LRC is that we kind of like put a quota in there so that they are more inclined to join. And we tell the community, like, you have to pick at least five women to join this LRC. Um, and then when they do, um, to avoid them, you know, being really shy and not stating their opinions during the meetings, we get into groups and we put them, we group them together because, you know, they're much, they're much more inclined to talk to one another. Um, but then we tell them, you know, present your findings and then they do, and we get to absorb that from them and, you know, put it on the board and have everybody see it. And now their ideas are up there on the board and the men get to see it too. And, um, you know, that kind of, I don't know, equalizes it a little bit. Um, I'm sure there's more that we could do. Uh, I guess it just will take some time to figure out what else, how else we can um, encourage more participation. Yeah. All right, one more. Okay, Ray. Good morning. Having had some experience with this or managing plans, particularly village based management and improvement in, in the fisheries for a specific locale. Is there enough flexibility in what you're doing that when those plans ultimately break down for some reason, is there a discouragement or, or they, is there enough attitude change that they can be rejuvenated and started again? Because uh, many of the things somehow just seem to crash when something goes wrong, poaching, mm -hmm. fishing, etc. Hmm. Have you had that experience with it? I mean, it's... Tried to that didn't work the problem and it didn't. Can you bring it back? Mm -hmm. um, it has happened. Um, it, and it's usually with like the projects that they try to in, implement on the island. So sometimes when they try to do like community gardens or even it, the installation of fish bases um, to, you know, provide fish to markets on like Major or mm -hmm. other uh, more densely populated areas, sometimes those things crash because they're not being maintained well. Um, and then, you know, years go by and maybe someone like me comes back to try to, um, assess their progress, but now they're mad at me <laughs> because they're like, well, you didn't support us and help us, you know, maintain this thing. Um, even though, you know, they probably were given all the types of training that they, that was necessary to do that thing. Sometimes th some things just don't fit, um, for a certain country, uh, a certain community. And then you just have to reevaluate and see what other projects are you know would work better for them yeah but i don't think there's ever discouragement maybe just like a little you know loss of trust with the national government um and you know you just work on gaining that back and letting them know that you're trying to help them yeah all right there's a reception outside let's thank that